Martin, welcome to Black Mountain Talks. Uh, we have uh, Larry Johnson, former uh, with us today. I think uh, my audience uh, knows him very well, so I'm not going to go into too deep introduction here. Thank you, Larry, for being with us. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I would uh, start uh, right ahead with um, some questions about the current um, situation in Ukraine. And I think the most um, uh, recent event currently are the attacks on the Russian border in Belgorod. Um, the, the Ukrainians try to penetrate the Russian border um, in the Belgorod region. What is your take on, the, on that? And is the Russian presidential election the only reason or are there more reasons as well? No, I think I think that's the principal reason. Uh, this is an act of desperation on, on the part of the Ukrainians. Uh, it, it really it, sending in four small groups to try to cross the border is not even a serious military uh, activity uh, because how do they sustain it? The, 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 to, to sustain an operation like that means you have to have a fairly significant logistics uh, support in place and they don't have that uh, so this is you know clearly designed uh, to try to disrupt if they can uh, the uh, presidential election in Russia to portray Putin as weak and capable of defending Russia it's all it's all a PR move uh, it does not solve Ukraine's fundamental problem and I've been talking about this for quite some time but it you know, I keep needing to emphasize it. Ukraine does not have enough trained soldiers and has no plan in place and no means of accomplishing it to get more trained soldiers. Uh, that, that's the problem in a nutshell. Without trained military personnel, they can't operate artillery, they can't operate tanks, they can't operate drones, they can't carry out uh, ground attacks. Uh, they don't have air power. There's a, air defense is being shredded. So I, it's just, you know, the, about everything that bad that could happen to the Ukrainian military is happening right now, and Russia is taking full advantage of it. Yes, right, of course. And this leads me to the to the next question: What you just said about the manpower? Um, it is about uh, ammunition and equipment. I mean, uh, one right. of the yeah, one of the biggest. Um, discussions in the Western media uh, currently are the American billions which should be released or not released and if they are released uh, the magical uh, you know ammunition and uh, equipment will arrive in in Ukraine the wonder uh, Wunderwaffen and will yeah. um, help <laughs> to turn the situation around um, will an unlimited supply of equipment and ammunition uh, solve the problem and who is going to use this ammunition and equipment yeah that, that that's the critical uh, problem uh, let, let, imagine that uh, I was uh, had had enough money I went out and bought a hundred uh, assault rifles you know whether AK uh, uh, the AK version or the American m4 version and so I got a hundred of them yeah. I give them to you. Well, you can only shoot one, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it happened to the other 99, okay, so what? You can only shoot one. And so even if this money comes through and they can pro provide uh, artillery pieces and uh, Patriot missile batteries and tanks, uh, who's going to operate them? It, it, it is, it's an issue that you can provide equipment, but then you're left with the task of who's going to operate it. So then that gets into the uh, question that, uh, or the, uh, well, actually we've seen evidence of it, that NATO personnel from, you know, Germany, from France, from the United Kingdom, from the United States have been sent to Ukraine to operate some of the equipment and, and uh, weapons that the Ukrainians cannot, simply because they don't have the training. Uh, the, the other aspect to it is, once, once this, if this money is approved, and I actually think it will get approved, uh, 
yes. because it's a political year in the United States, and uh, most of that money is going to go direct to defense contractors. Yes. And those defense contractors are in congressional districts, and they provide money to members of Congress or people who are running for reelection. So it's you know it's a bit of a scam. Uh, so most of that money is not going to make it make its way to Ukraine. But if it did, uh, you get they're in back to square one. What we talked about at the outset, no people to operate it. So it's uh, it's just it's it's another one of these. Let's call it a a useless but expensive gesture. Yes. Um, what is especially interesting as we speak um, is the situation on the on, on the front line. So as it looks like um, General Sierski is trying to pl plug um, holes everywhere uh, with um, human resources, which um, yeah, gets depleted on the front lines. Yeah. And um, the, the, the question is, um, of course, how, how long the front lines can be stabilized uh, by Sierski? And what, what what is your take on that on that on the on, on the situation on the front lines? Well, that, that's that's his problem. He can't stabilize it. They don't have enough reserves, and defensive positions are prepared uh, defensive positions to uh, hide out in. Uh, Russia's uh, change in tactics by using these glide bombs has really, it has been a game changer on the front lines. The power of those bombs, and, and understand that these are, you know, these have been in, in Russian military warehouses for years. And yes. what they did is they basically, they attached wings to them and uh, the aircraft that carry them are able to launch them at a, at a distance, say, 50, 60 miles from the target that they're going to hit. Uh, all of this is made possible by the, the development of uh, Russia's been effective in eliminating most of <clears throat> Ukraine's air defense system. Because understand that, you know, in the past, you know, if a plane was 60 miles from a target, it could still be vulnerable to say an S-300 uh, system right. or, or, or a Patriot missile battery. So now that those, those have been destroyed, these planes can still fly within, you know, 50, 60 miles or, you know, 40, let's call it 40 kilometers, and they can l let this bomb go. Well, when you've got uh, a 3,000 pound, you know, a 1,500 kilogram bomb hitting a defensive emplacement, uh, it, 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 it's massively destructive. And it doesn't matter how deep a hole the Ukrainians have dug to hide out in. Uh, it can, they can be killed, if nothing else, by the pressure wave uh, from that uh, bomb. So uh, no matter what Sirsky does at this stage, the, the Russians have a clear uh, advantage in terms of weaponry. And the combination of the ground forces with the uh, air power uh, really puts them in a unique position to press forward. And that's what they're doing. They're not just in one isolated area. They're pressing uh, almost along the entire front, which is about a thousand uh, kilometers long. And you know they're 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 gradually getting pushed back. They're, they've lost. They've really they've lost more territory in the last month than you could say they lost in the previous eight nine months. Yes, yes. Um, if if we um, assume for a moment that the Ukraine Ukrainians would um, get, uh, let's say, a million artillery shells, um, I think the artillery is um, keeping the Russians um, away from advancing too fast too quick. Uh, but at the end. It doesn't matter because the Ukrainians are getting um, destroyed at the front line where they are. So the Russians don't need to go forward. They can destroy the Ukrainians right where they are. So they don't need to go forward. So these Ukrainian shells, uh, the, these new shells would not change anything in the destruction of the Ukrainian army. Is it right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, <clears throat> the 
you, you have to look really at the ground that is the Donbass. Um, uh, one of one of the you know preeminent military historians in the United States, uh, David Glantz, um, uh, he, you know he wrote a, he wrote the book when Titans Clash was the co-author. It was right. about uh, the Russia's defeat of the Nazis in World War II. He was pointing out the other day uh, that the Donbass is not what you'd call ideal tank territory. It's got lots of ravines and marshlands, and it's just it's not designed and well suited for tanks. And the, the Germans discovered that it uh, they were able to use that whole area around Avdiivka and Bakhmut. As, as a key area to hold, uh, the, the, to really stop, the, the, they held up the Soviets back in World War II. Well, we're seeing that sort of that same, we've seen that same phenomenon. And the, the artillery shells were, you know, really played an important role in keeping, uh, you know, slowing up the Russians. But, you know, now for really more than a year, uh, the Russians have had about a seven to eight to one advantage in able to launch shells. It's not just the shells. The uh, b- the barrels of these weapons, uh, of these artillery pieces wear out. And so they have to be replaced. Well, you know, it's, it's not like they're at the local hardware store or, you know, the military surplus store. You run down and just grab a, a new artillery barrel to put on your piece. Uh, they have to be manufactured. And that's one of the other areas where the West has fallen short, uh, that they don't, they're not able to supply those in any kind of quantity. So uh, it's just the, the, the logistics picture facing the Ukrainians is, is, is very bleak, dire. Yes, right. Um, this leads me to my next question. <clears throat> uh, one of my key theses in, you know, in my, on my blog on Black Mountain Analysis is um, that the big Ukrainian cities like Kharkov um, or Dnepropetrovsk Niep- or um, Odessa are not going to be taken by force but they will most likely be surrendered because there is no one left to you know defend the, uh, these uh, these cities and now there are talks that uh, the ukrainians are about to um, withdraw from kharkov if the um, russian attacks intent- intensify they cannot plug the holes in manpower and they could potentially withdraw from kharkov um, what is your take on, on the whole picture of the big Ukrainian uh, uh, towns? Do, do you think they will be taken by force or will they be abundant? Uh, I, I think uh, <clears throat> the Russians prefer to not have to go in and battle, you know, engage in major urban combat. Uh, you know, cities like Kharkov um, and, and Kiev as well, and Odessa. Yes. Uh, they are so large that it would really require, require massive effort. It would be very costly in terms of casualties. Uh, but also those cities, by virtue of their size, if you can if you can cut off the you know surround them and then cut off all logistic support, <clears throat> food and fuel going in, you can you can force those cities to actually surrender. Uh, which I suspect that that's what Russia is going to do yes. uh, when, when they get to that stage, uh, instead of going in and wrecking the cities. Uh, places like Bakhmut, Avdiivka, uh, yeah, they're they're smaller, but they still, you know, they were. If you look at the the photographs and the video of, the, of these places with you know lots of apartment buildings and and high rises. Uh, these were not like isolated hamlets, and it took it took quite a while to, to take Bakhmut, like you know, for was it nine months, ten months of fighting. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, the, the Ukrainians are going to be faced with uh, uh, the choice: how do you sustain supplies to a city like Kharkov when the Russians are going to be able to be surround it? So that yeah, I think uh, I, I think it's likely that they will withdraw from that ultimately. 
Yes, yes. Okay, um, let's come to the next question. And um, there is a lot of, of talks about the Europeans are discussing to send troops to Ukraine, Ukraine, <coughs> especially the French um, as we speak. And I personally, I'm not very concerned about this because I don't believe uh, that uh, um, such a thing could materialize. But um, uh, which uh, scenarios, which options of the West do you see if if there are any at all um, to go into Ukraine? Again, you send people. How do you sustain them? How do you supply them? Uh, that's the, the real challenge. The, for, you know, France, let's say France sends uh, 20,000 soldiers. Okay, where is the logistics, you know, what they call line of communication to keep them with uh, adequate food, ammunition, uh, fuel, uh, in order to be able to operate? Well, it doesn't exist. And the, the French military knows that. That's why they've, uh, they have leaked uh, in the last couple of days to, the, to one of the French newspapers. Uh, a, a, a blistering critique uh, of uh, Macron's proposal and laying out that, you know, basically, the, uh, not basically, what they report in this in terms of the French military assessment is Ukraine's lost the war. It has no way to win it. So it, at this point, throwing military resources into Ukraine is just, you might as well be flushing them down a toilet. Uh, it, it, it's, it's nothing but waste. It, it's meaningless. The, you know, Macron is uh, so out of touch with reality. Uh, you know, having never served in the military is one of his big problems. But uh, just as we saw Hitler in his final days in the bunker in Berlin, moving magical armies, <laughs> you know, uh, mythical armies around that didn't exist, that's, yeah. what, Macron, that's what Macron is doing. Macron's doing the same thing. He's just not hiding out in a bunker. Yes, yes. Um, but what could be the reasons for for uh, him to demand uh, such actions? Is um, is it about the loss of of some colonies in Africa? Is it about the pounding of the French <coughs> soldiers in 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 Kharkov? Um, what what are the reasons? Well, you know. Uh, France has always wanted to assert itself as the leader of Europe, yes. uh, a role that the Germans managed to <laughs> reestablish in the aftermath of World War II. You know, they, they really, really angered the French. You know, they went to all this sacrifice to help uh, defeat Germany in World War II, and the next thing you know, Germany's mm -hmm. this economic powerhouse uh, that is, uh, you know, the, the lead kid in the class, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so here's Macron trying to assert himself and, and inject uh, France into that lead role. But as, as you correctly note, number one, the French are getting, you know, they've been driven out of Africa. So uh, on that front, uh, Macron is mad at the Russians, blames them, blames Russia for that. Russia didn't have anything to do with it, but uh, they become a, a convenient excuse for Macron to uh, blame it on Putin. Uh, and then with uh, the, the weakness of what perceived weakness of Germany, this is Macron's way, way to stand up and say, oh, yes, uh, we need to put fr uh, French troops in. But they've already put French troops in and they've been killed. Uh, you know, and the, uh, the notion that Russia is not aware of the foreign mercenaries and where they are and how many there are is just laughable. Uh, of course they know. Uh, this this is uh, the West has not learned any lessons at all over the past 70, 75 years. You you go back and read what uh, was happening uh, in the West back in the aftermath of uh, World War II, where with the early days of the CIA, you kept trying to foment a rebellion, a guerrilla war in uh, the, the then Soviet Union. They kept parachuting teams in behind, you know, Soviet lines, and the Soviets were waiting for them. 
would scoop them up, kill them, capture them, you know, put them in prison. Well, you know, the things really haven't changed. I think the, the Russians have a, a very sophisticated, well-developed intelligence capability, and they're able to uh, detect and know in advance when some of these activities are taking place. Or if I find out, yeah, there's you got a group of 120 uh, French uh, military personnel in this particular hotel. Good. We'll blow it up, which they did. Yes, yes, right. Um, you know what is interesting uh, to me? Uh, the <clears throat> If we just assume for a second, and um, I want to highlight that I don't think that it will happen, uh, but if you assume for a second that the French would somehow try to help the Ukrainians to free other front lines like Belarus or uh, Sumi or what, what, whatever, so that these are or the auxiliary units so that they can move uh, to the front lines. Um, the only thing which would um, happen is that these units would also die and only prolong the war, war maybe for two or three months. For me, uh, such a consideration is like genocide. Uh, they want to make sure that every single <clears throat> Ukrainian soldier dies before the, the war ends. Or is it just me? <laughs> well, look, the This wouldn't be the first time the French uh, committed themselves to a, a feckless, bloody military mission. Uh, remember in Vietnam, a little place called the Em Vim Phu, uh, the French thought that they were going to defeat uh, the North Vietnamese in that encounter, and they, they put themselves in an untenable military position down in a valley surrounded by mountains and jungle, And uh, they got slaughtered, beaten. Yeah. Uh, so uh, like, I said, it would, like I said, this wouldn't be the first time that the French did something militarily stupid. <laughs> uh, and uh, you, we, again, we get back to think <clears throat> through the logistics of it. So uh, how many, you know, what size military force are you going to send? Well, You know, let, let's say you're going to send a, a, a brigade or heavens, even just a battalion, you know, 500, 600 guys. Okay, what what are they capable of doing? Well, for a ground unit to, to be effective, it's going to need to have an artillery uh, package with it, which means more artillery pieces and more artillery shells, which the French don't have, <laughs> which they're not manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, and then what about uh, air cover? Uh, because that, you know, that's one of the things that uh, when, you, when you've got a ground force that's facing an attacking foe, it's helpful to have some air cover that can provide close air support, which means the planes can come in and drop bombs on, on an attacking enemy force or uh, strafe them uh, from the sky. But, you know, neither the Ukrainians nor the French have the air power to put in there right now that would uh, be able to survive. So it's just, you know, you start ticking it off. It is, uh, you know, the best that he could hope for was using French soldiers as a tripwire to say, oh, we, the, the Russians are now attacking the French. Therefore, we have to uh, enact Article 5 of the NATO Charter. Well, mm -hmm. that that's not automatic. Just... Okay, yeah, Article 5, we're activated. Okay, you have to go to Germany, you have to go to Britain, you have to go to the Netherlands, to uh, Italy, to Spain, to, to uh, the Netherlands, to Denmark. And you go to each of those countries, and they have to approve. They have to vote. Oh, yes, yes, we're going to send our troops. That's not going to happen. Uh, it's just not going to happen. They... Uh, I think they've recognized the dangers inherent uh, in escalating with Russia right now. And, and, and Vladimir Putin's made it very clear. He's a, he says, I'm not, we're not going to use nukes just because the French and the British and the Americans put their soldiers inside Ukraine. Yes. We're going to we'll kill them yeah. with, with, with a conventional way, but that's not going to precipitate use of a nuke. It's only if... Uh, The, the West decides to try to use nuclear weapons against Russia 
or uh, you know launches uh, some major uh, strikes in deep inside Russia, that then the Russians be looking at retaliating, and that and and initially you know I I think the West but by using attack of missiles and such might might be able to strike at targets inside Russia, which would then potentially leave Russia to doing conventional strikes outside. And once you start doing that, then the potential for escalation builds and this whole thing could get out of control quickly. Yes, yes, uh, definitely. So <clears throat> I'm going to uh, to get to the next question and um, I think you are the perfect uh, man to answer this question. It is about the 12 CIA stations, uh, yeah. which are in presumably in, in, in Ukraine. Um, are there, there 12 CIA stations in Ukraine? Do, do the Russians know where they are and why do if yes, why um, are they allowed to stay there? Yeah, I'm not sure how many there are. I mean, that was what that was the story that was reported in the New York Times. Um, yeah. What what I do believe, based upon you know history, is that uh, if those if there are CIA bases uh, in, in in twelve different locations near Russia's border. <clears throat> That the Russians absolutely know about them. In fact, it, it, it's highly likely that uh, the Russians have penetrated them with their own personnel, with spies, with moles. Okay. In other words, uh, so they know exactly what's going on, which could be one reason why, uh, up to this point, they haven't felt the need to destroy them, because they're able to collect intelligence knowing what's going on. But yeah. that would be, um, you, you know, the, the, when you go back and read the history of the CIA, that was one of the common themes that everything, you know, this, the CIA was a little bit like uh, uh, Wiley e. Coyote in the Roadrunner cartoons. I don't know if you're <laughs> familiar with those. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So here's this, here's Wiley e. Coyote always trying to come up with some scheme to mm. blow up the uh, road runner or trap the road runner or kill the road runner. And the road runner was always one or two steps ahead of Wile E. Coyote. Well, that, that really is a great metaphor for the CIA's efforts vis-a-vis -vis Russia and previously the Soviet Union. They would think that they had recruited uh, super spies or that they had, they had great access into the inner workings of what the Soviets or the Russians are doing. It turns out they didn't, and uh, it was just the opposite. Uh, uh, and so, I, I if, the, if those bases exist, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Russians have them compromised and know what's going on. And you know, they'll destroy them at the appropriate time, uh, if if necessary. But you know, this is this is not the first time that the CIA has been involved in Ukraine trying to collect intelligence on Russia and uh, trying to destabilize Russia. I mean, good grief. They started that back in like 1947, 48. <laughs> so <laughs> been doing it for over 75 years. Yeah, yeah. Right. OK, um, then let's come to the next question. Um, it is um, at the one hand about Ukraine and at the other hand um, also about the United States uh, Navy. So my question is um, the Russians with, let's say, withdraw uh, or however you want to call it, uh, their Black Sea uh, fleet um, more or less away from Crimea. So to protect them from these unmanned uh, naval drones. Right. Uh, and uh, one of the theses uh, in my Economics and Empires articles, articles um, is that um, navies worldwide are more or less um, no longer able um, to be used as a tool of power project projection. Mainly, yeah. Um, yeah. I consider it for the uh, United States uh, Navy because it was the main tool of the United States to project power in the, in, in the past. 
um, w w what is your um, opinion about both the, the, the Navy of the United States as a tool of power projection and the Black Sea uh, fleet of the Russians? Um, because as far as I can see, the Russians also suffer from the asymmetrical um, threat of new um, devices to, uh, to, 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 to fight naval uh, assets. What is your opinion? Yeah, well, let, <clears throat> let's let's start with the with the Black Sea Fleet. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the Russians recently have uh, done a command shakeup. Uh, it appears that the the previous commander was not taking every step possible and necessary uh, to protect the fleet. Uh, now, the the damage that's been done to the Russian ships it, it's it's really uh, limited, very, very limited. Uh, but it was it was sort of let's call it a PR victory for Ukraine. But it has not really changed the the the, the, the ability of the Russian Navy to project force in the Black Sea. Uh, they also have their uh, their submarines uh, there as well. And it, it, I think there is there's some thinking that uh, with better defensive measures and proactive defensive measures, uh, the ships can be protected against those drones. But then that brings the broader question that you're asking about the, the role, the critical role of uh, naval fleets to as a way to project force. And technology has really changed that. Uh, the, the sort of the, one of the cornerstones of the U.S. military strategy are these carrier battle groups carrier task forces, uh, these large aircraft carriers that are surrounded by, you know, cruisers and destroyers uh, that uh, they're ostensibly to project force. But but they have limited capability, as as you can see, with respect to what's happening off the coast of Yemen and the Red Sea. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. we're going on. The United States has been blasting away at those damn Houthis for four months and <laughs> What have they accomplished? Houthis are still there, still <laughs> launching rockets and missiles and and, and uh, yeah, threatening ships that are going to Israel. So, you know, the, the, the aircraft carrier has that limitation. But even more deadly are the hypersonic missiles. Uh, Russia has at least three versions, uh, three different kinds of uh, hypersonics. And, and the importance of that is the U.S. Navy does not have an air defense system on board any of their ships capable of shooting down a hypersonic missile, period. So that means if those aircraft carriers get too close to shore with a country that has uh, a hypersonic missile in its arsenal, those ships can be destroyed, easily destroyed. Uh, and then, you know, on top of it, you know, you got this other phenomenon that's taken place where uh, the cruisers and destroyers that accompany a carrier task force, that <clears throat> they have on board uh, these uh, air defense systems, and they're called and they're called vertical VLS, vertical launch systems. So basically, these missiles are in in these tubes in the deck of the ship, yeah. and once they fire them off, they don't. There's no way to automatically reload them. Those ships literally have to sail to a port and then go into port where they're then reloaded there. Uh, in the United States, for whatever reason, about 30 years ago, <clears throat> decided they'd get rid of what they call ship tenders. So if you go back to like in World War II, these carrier task force would be out there and when they'd, they'd, they'd use up all their ammunition and Along would come a ship tender who would reload them with food, with ammunition, and with fuel. So they were able to keep ships at sea because they had a way to resupply them. Well, the U.S. Navy no longer has that ability. Uh, they have a limited shelf life when they're out at sea. And they can only stay out for so long, and then they have to, you know, head back to port. So the, uh, the, the relevance of a naval fleet as a major military threat, I think, has diminished 
with the advent, particularly of the hypersonic uh, weapons, coupled with uh, the decisions that they've made in terms of logistic support for ships at sea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, let's come to the next question. Um, Dimitri Medvedev uh, just posted today a, a new uh, message on his Telegram channel. And <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> what, what did he say? <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> he, he um, said that he has also a peace formula for uh, Ukraine, like, you know, uh, Zelensky has also a peace formula and uh, Medvedev just posted his counter peace um formula and it is um like disintegrate uh, ukraine and uh, integrate it into russia <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, essentially that's what i think will happen maybe not of all of ukraine but uh, the biggest part um, i think um will be integrated but that's not the question the question is um w w what is your opinion about the current um Uh, la la landscape of peace formulas and peace talks and you know there are peace talks without Russia there are invitations for Russia to join these peace talks and w what's going on Russia <laughs> has zero incentive to engage in any quote negotiations at this point uh, to what purpose you know they've Uh, their goal is, uh, you know, stated at the outset, demilitarize Ukraine. In other words, eliminate its military and in terms of its ability to pose a threat to Russia and get rid of the Nazis, get rid of the Bandera um, uh, cult. Um, and to do that, you, you end up replacing government, making sure that a government's in place you know, that's not going to be Uh, encouraging such a uh, demonic ideology. So uh, to that end, I, I don't see why Russia would negotiate anything at this point. They, they did have a, you know, the deal that they offered Ukraine two years ago uh, that uh, the Brits and the Americans coerced the Ukrainians into not taking, uh, you know, would have, would have left Ukraine probably intact As, as, an, as a country, it's not going to be intact anymore. Uh, it is, it's in a death spiral uh, in terms of, you know, you've got, number one, it's uh, the, the refugees that have fled Ukraine, probably not going to come back. Uh, you've had an enormous loss of life uh, among men between the ages of 20 and 40, which are, You know, that, that age range is critical for, uh, you know, those are the guys that go out and get married and uh, their wives have babies yeah. uh, to replace population. Well, that's, that's not taking place. You've got a population bulge of people over the age of 50 in Ukraine. Um, the key industries that has provided economic income for the government, you know, tax revenue, Uh, those those are largely uh, in territory east of the Dnieper River, which means it's going to be under the control of Russia, not not uh, Ukrainian authorities. So uh, Ukraine is just, you know, it, it's a dying country, and it, uh, it hasn't maybe awakened to the fact that it's dying, but regardless of whether they can concede it or not, Uh, doesn't change the outcome. So, with that and with that background, I don't see why you know, from the Russian standpoint, what is there to negotiate about? You negotiate a surrender. That's the negotiation. Surrender. Yes, that's uh, essentially what Medvedev uh, wrote today. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. So let's move to the next question. Um, it is about um, a potential <clears throat> resistance within the Ukrainian um, society, or even mm -hmm. really, um, you know, um, par partisan fighters. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you think there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the reason I'm laughing is yeah. uh, go back. L let's look at the history of Ukraine uh, when it was part of the Soviet Union. 
And in the immediate aftermath of World War II, when the United States decided, oh my God, we've got a, the, the fear of communism now, it's greater than the fear of Nazism. And so decided to turn on and uh, make mm -hmm. Russia, uh, make the end Soviet Union the enemy, there was, there was active insurgency in, in Ukraine. What happened to it? Yeah. They were destroyed. The, you know, the Soviets beat them. Do we, do we think seriously that the Russians have forgotten how to do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is what is so ridiculous about Western ignorance of the past. Uh, they, 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 they neglect to even study, you, you know, the, the West tried it in, in 1999 when with the, with the Saudis were funding uh, the Chechens, these Islamic extremists that were operating in Chechnya. And they, they carried out a very bloody terrorist campaign and, and civil war. I mean, they were blowing up subways and buildings in Moscow. What did the Russians do? This was, and this was back when the Russian military was still struggling to, uh, to sort of get, get its feet back under it. They wiped them out. They destroyed them. Yep. So, you know, Russia's got experience with this. Plus, yeah, you're going you're gonna to launch an insurgency in, in Ukraine. I, I have heard some people that I, that I once respected who I thought were sound you know, knew something about the military that uh, seized upon this stupid idea. Well, this is not Afghanistan. This is not Iraq. The, because the Russians speak the language. The Russians, the, there are relatives. I mean, there's the families are, you've got families that uh, have, you know, relatives on both sides in Russia and in Ukraine. I mean, for God's sakes, look at Sirsky, the current general of Ukrainian forces. <laughs> Russia, I mean, his yeah. mom and dad are in Russia. His brother's in Russia. So, yeah, th this notion that they're going to stand up an insurgency and, oh, my God, it's going to weaken <laughs> Russia. It, it, it's uh, it, it's an, it, it, perhaps an inappropriate word, but it's bullshit. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, but um, my question was an other question. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, my, my, my question was uh, about the potential Russian insurgency in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine against the fascist um, <clears throat> uh, government. So we Slavs, we have a long history. My both grandfathers were partisans in Yugoslavia uh, uh -huh. and fought alongside Tito against the fascists so uh, I, I think we have we have it in our genes to do that and uh, not against russia but um, against the fascists in ukraine but for um, the time being i don't see much activities in this uh, direction do you think there is some kind of russian um, uh, resistance within ukraine um, or will there be resistance and if not why not well, Russia's going Russia's going to take this out in, using conventional military force um, and, and and intelligence networks that uh, are, exist within Ukraine. So mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure the, the Russian intelligence network has has penetrated both the, the political side uh, within the administration of uh, Zelensky as well as the military side. Uh, that they've got uh, they probably have. Assets, intelligence assets that are in, in positions of authority within the Ukrainian military. So they would you know, they wouldn't need to do any kind of insurgency. Uh, it's just, just going to be conventional military force ultimately that's going to uh, bring bring Ukraine to to the table to surrender. Yeah, yeah. So you don't think, you don't think that it is needed at all. Um, no. the, the end is perhaps uh, near. <clears throat> yeah, I think I think. Um, so I was saying, oh, you know, three, four months ago that I thought that this would be over by the summer. And at the time, there were only a few of us, I think, you know, Scott Ritter uh, shared the same opinion. But we, what we've seen now over the last two or three weeks, uh, hell, even uh, CIA director Bill Burns is saying that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... Now that you've got uh, people th throughout the West acknowledging 
that Ukraine mm -hmm. Ukraine does not have. Uh, you know, it's, I heard some of these people say, "Oh, well, um, th they could enter into a stalemate." There's, uh, oh, there's uh, Mark Sloboda. I guess that's his name. He's an American that's living in Russia and uh, has a Russian wife. Uh, yeah, he's he's been putting out some nonsense about all oh, this. This is going to be a stalemate. It can go on for two to three years. No, no. <laughs> I mean that that's not going to happen. Yes. Simply because Ukraine doesn't have the ability to sustain that. Uh, this this really gets down to, uh, you know. Do you have money to buy food? Yes. Do you have fuel? Uh, do you have income, uh, a source of income that's reliable? I mean, you know, some basic things like that. And then add to it, well, can, can you produce your own arms? Well, no. So you're going to have to get them somewhere. But where are you going to get them? It's not like uh, the United States and, and Europe have uh, stepped up their factory output. Just the opposite. I mean, for God's sake... You know, in Germany, where you are right now, you've got you've got a clown show with the Green Party. <laughs> they're, oh, yes. they're, they're, they're they're dismantling their industrial base. Yes, and then then they want to go fight a war with what? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, <laughs> they're, they're going to set up workshops in people's homes, you know, to to you know load load ammunition i it's just it's, it's absurd so uh this is um we're we're at a we're at a at a juncture where the the, the end of ukraine and this this entire feckless military adventure is going to come to an end if nothing else that the west doesn't have the, the west talks a lot but get past the talk what can they actually do to support well they don't they have no means to sustain uh, the military yes of course and if we uh, read uh, the western mainstream media then we see the the, the, the panic uh, spreading so it means yeah, uh, yeah. the end the end is near <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean this yeah. you know the we keep hearing about all boy you know what was one of the lines from a Joe Biden speech? NATO's never been stronger. You know, he's yelling. <laughs> well, <laughs> if if the current status of NATO is as strong as it's been, boy, it is really bad shape. Uh, yeah. The the divisions that are clearly evident between Germany and France right now is just one one example. And then throw Hungary into the mix. And uh, you've got some other states that are starting to balk. And uh, in, in Poland as well, but Poland's, uh, you know, dealing with its own internal problems with farmers, not too keen on allowing any products in from Ukraine. So it's the, the situation for NATO, even though they've quote added Finland and Sweden, Ooh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, man, we've got 5,000 more soldiers. Boy, that's great. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> let's come to the last uh, question uh, about Ukraine. Um, we talked uh, recently on Black Mountain Talks with Scott Ritter, and um, he told us that he had a um, conversation with uh, Abdi Alaudin, uh, the <laughs> Russian or the Chechen uh, general, and um, he <laughs> to told him that there are some... Uh, processes in place uh, which will uh, eventually lead to some big changes in May and perhaps to the end of Ukraine in September. But of course, he couldn't talk about details, that's clear. Uh, what is your uh, take on that? Uh, hang on for a second. My dog's going crazy. Of course, of course. I've got somebody in the backyard. Stand by. Yeah. Sorry, somebody had uh, come in the back. Um, no yeah, no, I think uh, the, the Russian general staff have, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they're very skilled at planning. Uh, they've done one thing that Western, or Western military hasn't. They plan. And they, they've, they understand the process of, you know, what resources do we need? How are we going to marshal those? Uh, they, they don't get out in front of themselves. 
And so I think they, they've been building up the, you know, they were under no time pressure that they had to defeat Ukraine in six months or 12 months. Uh, in fact, go back to, you know, one of the common themes you hear in the West is that, oh, well, the Ukrainians stopped, Putin wanted to take Kiev and capture Kiev and the, the Ukrainians stopped him. Now that the, 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 there's really no evidence that that was the intent of Russia at the outset of the special military operation. They were wanting to put pressure on Ukraine because I think they did have an intelligence failure. Russia did. Uh, they imagined that they would be able to, uh, you know, co-opt some of the Russia, uh, Ukrainian military leadership and get them to surrender and that they'd be able to accomplish this without having to go, you know, go on a war footing. And it was uh, only after the sabotage peace talks by the West, uh, and then uh, Ukraine's subsequent attempt to launch an offensive that the Russians realized, okay, we've got to go on a war footing. They mobilized the 300,000. And again, in mobilizing 300,000, that may, means you're, you're committing to training your troops. They're, they're not like Ukraine where they're just trying to, you know, grab guys off the street, put a uniform on them, mm -hmm. shove a gun in their hand, and then take them to the front where they don't even know what they're doing. Uh, you know, the Russians put their soldiers through the the requisite, um, you know, minimum of really a, a four to five month uh, training program. So they, they've been building up and preparing all along for this final push. And when it comes, uh, by, you know, the... I don't think the you know, Ukraine is not going to be do, able to do anything to stop it, nor will the West. So uh, I guess I fully anticipate, you know, Kharkov will fall, Kiev will fall, uh, all of the cities that line uh, the Dnieper River will fall under Russian control. They'll be back in Kherson, uh, and they ultimately they'll take Odessa. So that, you know, I think that's, that's their, their broader plan. Um, and they're 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 going to do this without uh, you know trying to avoid fighting the West. Th they will kill NATO soldiers inside Ukraine. That you know Russia won't have a problem with that. But uh, they've been cautious about you know, like say shooting down uh, reconnaissance aircraft like the KC one hundred and thirty five or even drones that uh, fly over the Black Sea. Uh, just to, uh, they, they don't want to create uh, an excuse for the West to try to escalate uh, tensions. But uh, the West is going to be presented with a, an untenable situation. Uh, Ukraine will not have enough military force. It will not, does not have the weapons it needs, doesn't have the ammunition it needs. It's not going to be able to sustain what force remains in the field. And uh, they're, they're going to be compelled to surrender. I think that's where this is headed. Yeah, I fully, fully agree about that. Um, I have two more questions. Um, sure. and now I'm going to um, move away from Ukraine and uh, talk a, li a little bit about, uh, you know, my economics and empires um, a series of articles. And um, yeah, let's talk about Israel. <clears throat> So um, I think you covered uh, the, the events happening in Gaza and Israel um, very, very well. So I would like to zoom a little bit out um, yeah. on the bro broader um, Middle East. And yeah, w one of my theses in my um, you know, um, articles is um, that, Israel, that the creation of Israel, um, one, of, one of the reasons for the creation of uh, Israel was to, um, after the withdrawal of the you know, British Empire from the Middle East, to have something inside to cause uh, constant um, trouble, let's call it trouble, uh, conflicts, um, <clears throat> division, um, only to control the prices of the oil, the currency in which the oil is traded and the volumes which are um, produced of oil and you can do that uh, with you know divide and conquer and you need something inside to steer up the trouble um, a against the arabs and b the arabs against the arabs itself so you know the sunnis and the Shiites and the alevites and uh, who knows what so yeah. um, uh, 
what is your opinion about that? If we zoom out and look at the strategic picture, <clears throat> uh, I, I don't. I you know I think let's go back to the creation of Israel in 1948. Yeah. Um, it was it was really somewhat of an accident uh, because it was not uh, it was not envisioned by Harry Truman at the time as you know it wasn't one of his top five policy priorities. Yeah. Uh, he was basically persuaded to do it, uh, according to Truman, by his former business partner and uh, World War I uh, buddy uh, who, who was Jewish and uh, who was tied into the Zionist movement back then. Uh, the, uh, the, the storyline of <clears throat> the Jews who survived the Holocaust in Europe and the need for a homeland you know, it, um, what, what I find fascinating is that when the United Nations approved it, the then Soviet Union, who had veto power, didn't block it. Yeah. Uh, uh, nor, nor did China uh, block it. So, you know, the the creation of Israel, I think, I, I think it really had more to do with uh, some genuine sympathy, trying to correct. Uh, the, the the failure of the West to stop the Holocaust when it was happening, uh, and you know, sort of the irony of that is we're now we've lived long enough to see seventy years later that Israel itself is carrying out a Holocaust against uh, Palestinians. That they that the some of the very techniques and tactics that the Nazis used against Jews are being used against Palestinians. Uh, you know, the uh, when, when you walled up Jews inside ghettos in places like uh, Lutz or or Warsaw or yeah. Lviv, uh, they were uh, they were starved. They didn't have freedom of movement. They couldn't. Jews could not come and go at well. They were they were basically incarcerated. Yeah. Well, that's that's what has happened to the Palestinians. Now, uh, the the issue of oil. I think really came to the forefront in the 1950s. Um, you know that was that was one of the major driving, uh, one of the major factors that led the United States to to launch that coup inside Iran and to and to take out Mossadegh yeah. uh, because of you know Mossadegh's uh, efforts to nationalize really nationalize and, and drive out these foreigners. From controlling the oil, uh, so that, that I think that it was in uh, at that point that we started seeing the preeminence of oil. I, at Israel's location at the time, you know, it was it didn't provide major military bases for the United States. Uh, I, I don't think it really it was seen as that critical with respect to, to the, the oil interests, but but that has changed over time. Um, the you know I I guess I have been. Maybe surprised is not the right word, but uh, <clears throat> Turkey is a major supplier of oil to Israel. Right. Yeah. And Turkey could force Israel to stop this needless slaughter of the Palestinians by cutting off the oil, but it doesn't do it. Why? Well, Erdogan and his family are making money off of it. People that surround Erdogan are making money off of it. So... It's the old golden rule. Those with the gold get to make the rules. Yeah. Um, and, and and so a, a, a lot of the policy uh, that the, has, has guided the United States, I think you're correct, is, you know, supporting, uh, going after uh, the oil and securing access to it. I mean, that's one of the reasons you've got a U.S. <coughs> small detachment of U.S. special operations forces in uh, Eastern Syria that are guarding Conoco's uh, oil field. So, you know, the, the the oil has been a major driving force. There's no doubt about that. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, thank you for that. And yeah, let's move to 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 my last question, <clears throat> and um, it is about Germany and Europe. So Germany, as you um, 
just uh, said is heavily deindustrializing itself. Um, yeah. And the one of the major drivers is uh, the Green Party. Yeah. So the economy is going uh, down, and um, it is ever uh, harder for 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 the Germans to pay social benefits, which um, is one of the reasons um, to keep the Germans quiet for the time being. And at the other hand, spendings in the military and and then spendings on Ukraine, of course, is rising. So I think um, the Germans don't feel very well about the situation. Uh, it is a very dangerous mixture. So in the past, the Germans could uh, sustain all of this through cheap uh, Russian um, gas at the one hand. And um, uh, at the other hand, there was no need to spend for military because the United States provided protection. Uh, or in other words, the United States paid for, for the military. So this is changing um, rapidly. So one of the theses in economics and empires is that um, from Germany's downfall in Europe, there could um, evolve a very dangerous situation within Europe, which could even lead to war or civil war with, between the Europeans um, without Russia. Um, what is your opinion about that? Yeah, I, I, I don't think the civil war necessarily is, is, is likely. Um, you, you know, part of what, I don't know if we can change it, but the mentality that exists with respect to military spending and defense sectors uh, is it's getting exposed as sort of uh, ridiculous. You know, look at the United States. We're, we're now, our, our, our defense budget is close to $900 billion. It's, it's appro approaching a trillion dollars. And some would argue that it's actually, you know, the, 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 in, in reality, it is over a trillion dollars. Well, what does that buy? It hasn't, hasn't made the world safer, more secure. In fact, you can make just the opposite argument. Um, and... Um, the, these nations that in the, you know, sort of the, let's call it the, the past of the colonial empire, where Germany had an army, France had an army, the Brits had an army, the, those armies were there to go out and conquer territory. And then the battles that took place within Europe, that, uh, you know, the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, you know, there... The, the battles were always raging within Europe and, uh, you know, we go back when Napoleon marched on Moscow. Uh, so, uh, but, but now we're in a, we're, we're in a different time. Um, and the, 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 the cost that's required to build up and sustain a military force uh, is significant. And, uh, you know, Germany is... Uh, has basically created uh, a dynamic that's going to make that impossible to sustain. This really, this is sort of, it reminds me a little bit of this. Uh, there was a movie made about uh, the coup against Salvador Allende in Chile. Yeah. And at one point in this movie, and it wasn't intended to be funny, but it was funny. Uh, at least, you know, I laughed when I saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Allende, Salvador Allende is wearing, a, he's got a helmet on uh, from, the, from the military. And he turns to his aide and he says, we need to call the people to the streets. Tell them to bring their guns and surround the palace here and we'll, de we'll defend ourselves against the, the army. And his aide goes, uh, well, sir, you confiscated all the weapons. They don't have <laughs> weapons anymore. <laughs> so, that, 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 that's what I see Germany's doing to itself. It's basically confiscating all the weapons, and then it's going to turn around and say, okay, to the barriers. <laughs> and the people, there's not going to be invited to go to the barriers because they don't have any weapons. Uh, so they've d essentially disarming themselves, uh, which, which, you know, candidly might not be a bad thing. Uh, if Because this it's all predicated on a lie the reason germany needs a big military is to pre prevent 
protect itself from Russia because Russia is going to invade it. No, it's not. <laughs> no. no, it's not. I mean, the, the history of Russia, quote, invading other countries in Europe, it only, the, 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 I think, you know, what was it, 1815, when they marched into uh, oh, yeah. Paris? Yeah. Um, after, after they had been attacked by, uh, by Napoleon? So uh, apart from that, Russia has been intent on consolidating the territory uh, on its on its borders. You know, the, instead of having hostile uh, countries in Moldova and Georgia and uh, the stands the, from Turkmenistan, uh, to Kazakhstan, uh, Turkestan, you know, the run down all the stands. Yeah. Uh, but but it is not, Russia has not been the kind of imperial power that the Germans, the French, the Brits, uh, the Dutch, you know, look at all the mayhem they caused around the world by conquering other countries. That was the reason they had these militaries, so that they could project force in these other countries. Uh, Russia's military has really primarily been, you know, protect the country from uh, foreign invaders. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I always enjoy your movie references. <laughs> yeah. There was this movie with uh, Michael Keaton you once um, recommended. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, where they're clone. Uh, <laughs> Multiplicity, I think. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> it was great. Okay, no, uh, that was my uh, last question. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. Um, if you want, you can uh, just uh, tell, uh, tell our, our audience where they can fi find your work. Yeah, yeah. So I I blog and post at sonar21.com, S-O-N-A-R-21.com. That stands for Son of the New American Revolution, 21st Century. Yeah, great. Um, I will link it, of course, um, in the YouTube uh, video and in uh, Substack. Um, thank you very much, and I, I, I hope to see you soon again. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. It's always a pleasure. appreciate you having me on. Yeah, thank you. So...